If this gets too loud, then let me know and I will step back a little bit. My voice tends to carry, so I don't want to uh, make anybody's ears hurt. But um, again, tonight is the uh, public input meeting on the Brackenridge Park Master Plan. And so um, before we begin, I also would like to invite Lynn Bobbitt with the Brackenridge Park Conservancy. She is executive director of the Conservancy and uh, would like to share a few words with everybody this evening. Good evening, everybody. I see some faithful people who've been to almost every meeting. Uh, as Xavier said, I'm executive director of the Brackenridge Park Foundation uh, Conservancy, and it was formed in 2009 as a nonprofit organization, and it was formed in collaboration with the City of San Antonio and the San Antonio Conservation Society, as well as community groups uh, surrounding neighborhoods around the park, uh, the Witty, the, the uh, zoo, uh, the golf course, and other stakeholder groups. And it was formed to be an advocate and a steward for the park, to be the counterpoint, actually, to the city, working with them and collaborating, but bringing to them ideas from you, the people who use the park, and the community. Um, this process, I've been listening very carefully as we have had the various meetings. We've had eight total, including tonight. And um, there, there are things that can and should be done in the park. So as you listen tonight to the presentation, I would like to ask you to please think of, of some of the things that Homer is going to describe to you and, and see where we might come to agreement. This is that going to be a long process. This is not a night for making decisions, but it certainly is a night for ongoing conversation and discussion about what we want for our park. I'm a native San Antonian and have many memories, as you do, of the park. So I'm here to uh, hear from you and carry on conversation so that we can report back to the professional team that uh, will take your comments to heart. Um, once you are in the park, you see things a bit differently than you do from plans that we will look at tonight. And so I would like to offer to give you a tour. I did this the other night, and I had about 15 people that signed up. It's a little hot right now, but if you give me your name and address, I'll start this clipboard around, and I'll be happy to call you and show you some of the things that perhaps that we could agree upon. So I look forward to this evening. Thank you, Lynn. So again, everybody, good evening. My name is Homer Garcia. I am the Acting Assistant Director for the Parks and Recreation Department. And it's my pleasure to be here this evening and share with you the, uh, really where we're at in the master plan process for Brackenridge Park. Um, it all started with the FY15 uh, budget adoption where funds were allocated by council for this project. So some of the questions that you know we've heard over the uh, prior meetings has been why? Why are we doing this? What's wrong with the park? There, there's nothing wrong with the park. Um, but you know, our job is to implement the direction and policy of council. And since funds were allocated for this project, uh, the process began with uh, soliciting a consultant team to work on the draft master plan and develop the strategies that I'll be reviewing here with you this evening. I'd like to introduce our project team led by uh, Jim Gray with Rialto Studios. So Jim, you could say hello. He's up here in the front of the room. Um, and we also have some project team members in the back. If uh, I could recognize Jamal Moreno with uh, TCI. And we also have Irby Hightower with Alamo Architects here. So what we'll go through is um, a summary of the strategies that have emerged today and then when I'm done with the summary we will uh, allow citizens that signed up to speak three minutes uh, if it's an individual or nine minutes if it's a group to share your comments and and we've got our project team and note takers here this evening so that everything that's shared is captured as we go back and work on finalizing um, the, the draft master plan. But you know, one important thing I want to highlight is you know, not only you know, some of the questions that we asked is 
you know, why this project, but also how we got here this evening. And, and through uh, former Councilwoman Betty Osabo, she identified and the need for additional public input and engaged Councilman Trevino so that we can do just that. And uh, he's here this evening, Councilman. I want to thank you. Do you want to come up and say a few words, Councilman? So, Councilman Trevino is with us this evening. He'll uh, share a few words regarding the master plan process. Hi, uh, good evening. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to say a few words as uh, I, I would like to add uh, to that explanation about how we got here today. Um, as, as mentioned, uh, uh, Maria Bello Sabal did contact our office uh, and, and we began uh, a, a discussion with, with the Conservancy and so we're very, very uh, appreciative of the Conservancy uh, come, stepping up and, and talking with us and, and working with us. Uh, we then uh, contacted Parks and Recreation to, to really get a better understanding of what this is really about. This is about is parks that belong to the entire city. Brackenridge Park is a much bigger park and needs, we need to address our history, our traditions, our culture, and, and this was really important to, for us to address. Uh, I understand Councilman Saldana will be here a little bit later as a previous engagement, but I also want to thank Councilman Saldana because um, as we began to address the specific issue, we knew that the best way to approach this was to get this, these kind of meetings out to the different quadrants of our city. We insisted on four meetings. It grew into six meetings that you now know of, and we wanted to get, get this out there. And this is an important, important uh, outreach, and Councilman Saldana was was very, very helpful in helping us identify where we hold these meetings and, and, and when. So, uh, and I want to thank Councilman Saldana's office for that. So I'm very appreciative. We look forward to your input. Uh, I, I want to tell you that uh, we're very happy to know that, uh, that this has been, a, I think, a very important process. We're all learning. We're very, very uh, appreciative of all groups and all parties being involved. And this is, this is not uh, something that, that we're going to uh, forget. We're going to want to learn from this process on other projects that we have going on throughout the city. Uh, as you may or may not know, there's always an issue uh, about protecting, I think, our most important asset in San Antonio, and that's our history and traditions. And so I think that's what this is about. So thank you again, and thank you to Parks and Rec. Thank you, Councilman, for your words and for your leadership on this issue and, and working with your colleagues to help facilitate these community meetings. As he mentioned, we're getting out to, to the different quadrants of the city. And so tonight is the last meeting for us to gather the input as we work to refine some of the strategies. And, um, and so I'll go through and uh, highlight these strategies and then um, identify kind of just where we go from here. Uh, but one of the things that I think is important to note is what you see, and, and I want to make sure that everybody has these handouts here. So if you don't, if you please would raise your hand and um, someone on our project team will get you a copy. But this is what will guide tonight's discussion. And we also have uh, some large visuals of this exact same information in the back of the room. And upon conclusion of this oversight and summary and listening to everything um, people here have to say, there's the opportunity to ask some more detailed and specific questions at these stations where we have project team staff and they'll provide you with the dot. And at the bottom, which you don't see on the handouts in front of you, but is in the back of the room, is a scale on the bottom that allows you to indicate your level of support from strongly support to in the middle and strongly do not support. And so um, the color of dot, depending on what you get, makes no difference. Uh, but make sure that uh, you have the dot so that you can go up and look at these up close and indicate to us the things that we are kind of doing right and are on the right path and, you know, maybe not. And so that, that's what we want to get from everybody this evening um, by no means is this a done deal? No decisions have been made. 
The only decision that's been made is we needed to do more public engagement and Parks is, wants to be responsive and make sure that at the end of the day, the draft master plan that's ultimately presented is reflective of the community's input. So while um, this is not an implementation plan, it is intended to be a guiding document, a vision plan, if you will, for Brackenridge Park, which the goal is to protect, preserve, and restore the cultural and historic resources of the park. And as we go through these different strategies and specific elements, you'll see how they kind of borrow on each other and may bleed together a little bit, but that's kind of the, the, the pivot block, if you will, making sure that what we're doing is protecting, preserving, and restoring the, the rich and cultural assets of the park. Now, unfortunately, while there was funding for a project to come up with a master plan, there is no funding identified for any of the strategies that ultimately move forward for recommendation to be implemented. That remains to be seen. That is unknown yet. And whether or not any of these end up as potential 2017 bond projects, we don't know. It's a possibility, but at this point, it's premature because we're still at a point that we need to make sure we've captured the necessary input so that at the end of the day, we can put forth a quality plan that is supported by the community. So as we go through these strategies, and because it is only a vision document, there are no design elements in place here. These are merely concepts. And from those concepts, should they, any of them move forward, then we have more fruitful discussion about what does that look like and how do we implement this. So we're not working with a blank slate, unfortunately, which quite frankly would be a lot easier from a park development standpoint. We have the existing park, the existing footprint, and, and that presents some opportunities as well as challenges. At the end of the day, through the master plan, park use will not change. Nowhere in the plan does it talk about charging for camping on Easter weekend or increasing fees in, in, in a specific area for park use. At the end of the day, the way the public gets to use and interact the park interact with the park today is what will still be in place in the end. This does not address any programming either. You'll notice there's opportunities when we go through these different uh, vision elements where there could be programming. This doesn't address that and how that will be delivered. So what I'd like to do is uh, begin reviewing this handout that hopefully everybody has. And if there are questions upon conclusion of my presentation, as I indicated, we'll be heading into the citizens that signed up to speak. But I assure you, I'm not going anywhere. And so after the citizens signed up to speak, we'll address any questions that you may have. Either ask me or again, any of our project team members that are here this evening. So the first strategy is increase visibility and pedestrian access to and within the park. Within this strategy, there are three component elements. The first one being creating a common park theme or entrance. Kind of look at that as maybe another way of branding the park, if you will. So for example, people who maybe don't visit the park as often, may not know what's the best way to get to the park, or what's the park entrance. Or if you're a tourist heading maybe north on Broadway, you drive right past the park and they don't know. They see the Witty and then they think, oh, the Witty's at the park, so we must be at the park, and then they circle back around. So the thought behind this is, because there are multiple ways that the park can be accessed, if we had a common theme so that people know when they're there and something they can look for and identify with, depending on which entrance to the park they utilize. Second element, increase park connections to neighborhoods 
and the Broadway corridor. One of the, the opportunities that the team has identified is how we can increase pedestrian connectivity to the park from the immediate neighborhoods and surrounding neighborhoods. Those connection points are, are relatively weak and so as we look at increasing park safety and allowing people to safe passage into the park, this is the thought behind that concept and how do we deliver that. Third, add multi-use pathways to increase pedestrian flow. So that's the theme again of pedestrian safety and how people move about through the park north and south, east to west. Through this master plan, no park roads are being removed and, and torn, torn up, but there's opportunity to look at maybe modifying some of those roadways and how they're used on a daily basis, maybe versus a special event basis that would allow greater safe passage for people on foot, bikers, runners, what have you. And this inset, which there's a much larger one in the back, that red path identifies one example of where that can be implemented within the park as it exists today. The second strategy, recapture green space in lieu of impervious cover and parking. And this has been one of the items that has generated a lot of uh, discussion and input. And I want to make sure that, you know, remind everyone and encourage everybody to provide that input here this evening. Because again, I will reiterate, nothing's been decided at this point. So the thought behind this is, how can we, you know, recapture some green space? There's, there's, it's not because we would be going and acquiring more property, but in effect, if green space, uh, where there's a, some parking spaces, for example, if those parking spaces are removed, that's an opportunity, in effect, to kind of enlarge the park within its existing footprint and allow that space to be repurposed. That's kind of the thought behind this general uh, strategy or concept. And one of the things the, the project team noted was the park, one-fifth of the park today is impervious cover, either through parking lots, asphalts, rooftops, 20% of the park, and, and that's um, an astounding number. And if that's something that we look at, um, that the public wants, it's just how do we implement that? Secondly, establish parking garages outside the park perimeter. So in this inset here, and again, it's a lot easier to kind of see in the, in the large boards in the back, the yellow dots or the yellow circles, if you will, identify potentially where parking garages could be located. None of these are on city park land. And this doesn't reflect that there's seven, seven yellow dots, all then there'd be seven garages. This again is just a theme, a concept. Is it one garage? Where would it be located? What we do know, to be consistent with what the first strategy uh, is trying to achieve by increasing pedestrian safety, these garages would be along the park perimeter. And yes, so I'll go through um, some details. So um, one of them on the southern limit, and again, if uh, I'll go, I'll highlight some of these. But we have our project team here that at the end where the larger visual board is, which is much, much easier to see. We can provide better um, visual, I guess you see basically better where it's located. But in this inset, the most southern location is near the Duseum. And up in the far kind of left corner, that, that yellow one there on the far left, that's school district property. So the idea is to strategically possibly have these garages located that allow people to access points of interest as well as the park. And so, um, and then the red line there, which I uh, talked about how some of these elements borrow and leverage on each other. 
that red line is po the potential route for what is being identified as a people mover or a tram or a shuttle of sorts. So in this one, letter 2C, convert St. Mary's parking lot to a grand lawn. This is one of those opportunities where we talk about recapturing green space in lieu of impervious cover. This area in particular is the large parking lot by the Brackenridge Eagle, the train depot. And so if, you know, in theory, if that comes out, you recapture green space where you gotta have parking, where does that go? And so back to potentially garages along the park perimeter would be uh, one of those options. <coughs> Correct, yes ma'am. So nowhere in the master plan does it talk about removing the Breckenridge Eagle, removing the Witty, removing the zoo. The train would stay in place. This is intended only to identify where um, the Grand Lawn conceivably could go, which in, in terms of the, the master plan is kind of referred to as the Grand Lawn or the heart of the park. This is one of the areas where previously we've been asked, well, what are you gonna do there? And, you know, it's um, summer in San Antonio and it's hot. Where are the trees? Going back to nothing has been designed. And, you know, people talked about the lack of there not being picnic tables or recycling bins here. This was just intended to identify a location where people could congregate in the heart of the park. But, of course, with that, should something like that move forward, then that's when those design questions come into play. But to answer your question, no, the, the train track would not be removed and that amenity would still be there. And before I go on to the next slide, um, gentlemen, Brady? Quick question. Yes, sir. Covered, that includes rooftop structures and they are within the footprint of the park, so that's an accurate statement. So it everything in the it's, it's within the footprint of Breckenridge Park. Yes, so uh, pervious cover basically is, um, an example would be an asphalt parking lot that does not allow water to kind of run through it and, and drain into Mother Earth, if you will. Strategy number three, uh, and I, I, if you, yes ma'am, one more question. So, as I indicated before, um, through this master plan process, park use will not change. Having a condominium structure or high rise or anything like that would be changing park use. So that is not something that would come out of this master plan process. The, the thought and again and intent here was to provide a focal point within the park where community families could congregate and you know whether that becomes through special event programming or other items are, are yet to be determined. Again, this is only intended to provide a potential vision for how the park could look, not so much talk about what hypothetically could happen. But again, at the end of the day, there's no existing living spaces in, in the park and so that's not gonna come out of this. That would be changing park use. That is not something we wanna do. We wanna stay true to the basic premise and goal of preserving, protecting, and restoring the park's cultural and historic resources. So I'll move on to strategy number three. Kinda of just hits on what I just indicated. And I'm gonna ask, uh, ma'am, I will come back to you. I wanna get through this, next, um, through this next sheet. It ties directly to Okay, th thank you, ma'am. And we'll, we're making note of, 
those comments. And again, I want to encourage anybody, um, if you want to sign up to speak, we do have sign-in sheets in the back, so feel free to sign up. And again, we'll allow you three minutes for an individual and nine minutes for groups. So number three, restore natural park features and improve water quality. So there's four primary elements here. Uh, this talks about restoring and stabilizing the San Antonio riverbanks. The river runs throughout the park, and you know one of the things that you know is identified, which you know we've always known, but kind of like when you see it written on paper, you tell a different thing. But because there's such a vast array of assets in this park, it's costly to maintain, and one of those is the San Antonio River. And so while we do have current efforts underway to do this where the most need is, this highlights the opportunity to do even more. And, and not only in restoring the, the banks, but in the end, helping to improve water quality through those efforts. The on the... Care of that, hmm? The river authority takes care of that? The, the park is, the, 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 the parks department is responsible for the riverbanks. We, that is maintenance that we perform. Not the San Antonio River Authority? No, ma'am. Um, the second element in this uh, strategy The goal here in this strategy is to look at things that we can do that restore the natural features of the park as well as how we can do that to, to impact the water quality. So I, I, the, of the San Antonio River. And again, I want to encourage everybody, I want to be sensitive to everybody's time. So I want to ask that we hold all questions until after I'm done with this presentation. And again, if you have questions, comments. Um, we have citizens signed up to speak and our project team, as well as myself, will be available to answer any direct questions any of you may have. So um, the second element in this strategy is restoring Katapa Pershing Channel to a natural design with pedestrian walks. So this is a man-made structure along the east side of the park. And what you see in the inset is what it looks like today but how it could be restored to a more natural design that again, lends itself to improving the water quality, not losing the functionality of the Catalpa Pershing and, and having it become uh, an, an aesthetic and attractive part of the park as opposed to kind of what it looks like today as you drive by or walk by along that area. Um, number three C, remove invasive species. This is not something that is unique to Breckenridge Park. We have this in many, many of our parks, and it is something that the Parks Department strives to try to focus on where we need to recapture and restore and preserve our natural areas. And so there are natural areas within Breckenridge Park where invasive species exist. And so again, it, it presents opportunity going back to preserving the, the, the natural landscape of the park, this lends itself to just that. And then lastly, uh, the 3D incorporate low impact development features. This identifies the opportunity where through any park,